show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, only guards stay fed. Deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melt of Bobby living. Time to build a new system, unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue, talking heads left his best. The saga continues. The No Miki Show. Both to being counted somewhere. Uh, that uh, today, that somewhere is in San Francisco. The school board recall election. It's being fueled by backlash to some progressive policies. But more than that, might be a potential warning sign to progressives everywhere. When you have the phrase, even liberal San Francisco parents, well, they're signaling they've hit their limits, then you know you may have a political problem. Three school board members, including the president, Gabriela Lopez, are up for recall in the solidly democratic city for pursuing symbolic liberal causes, like renaming schools, you know, from people like Dianne Feinstein, as classrooms stayed shut due to pandemic restrictions. The recall effort has the backing of Democratic Mayor London Breed. She had that uh, enough is enough speech on shoplifting a few weeks back. And according to the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, has attracted nearly $2 million in campaign spending. So folks, parental anger has been a force ever since schools weren't remote. And the political fallout around this issue has only intensified as we approach the midterms. And it hasn't mattered if it's in blue America or red America. Oh, Chuck Todd, MSNBC. That's an interesting take. Uh, first, you mentioned that it's heating up as we go into midterms. That's interesting. Second, you know, you, you make it sound like this is a progressive problem. No, no, no. It's not a progressive problem. It's a Democratic Party problem. The reason why it's a Democratic Party problem is because this is the right wing coordinated attacking the root of education, whether it's Critical race theory, whether it's mask mandates, whether it's the Koch brothers investing and taking over school boards and now the Proud Boys taking over school boards. The right wing has an agenda to take on education in this country because obviously they want to uh, teach what they want to teach in schools, which is the obvious answer. But also going into the midterms, they want to take on the institution that is the largest organized uh, donor to the Democratic Party, and the largest public sector workers. One out of 10 public sector workers, and there are a little, little over 20.5 million public sector workers in this country, much weaker than used to, of course, but one out of 10 are teachers. The teachers' unions are the strongest, most powerful unions in this country, and they donate to Democrats. So every time you see one of these education issues pop up, remember, that the conservatives are preying on parents who care about their children. They're putting information out there on Fox News and in their, their long pipeline that goes all the way to the anti-vax community. They're preying on parents that they feel in times of insecurity and instability, and understandably so. You know, folks have been teaching their kids at home and have been worried about their kids, you know, not having vaccines, not being masked, actually being masked. Turns out only 7% of parents who have children in school uh, do not want their children to be masked and vaccinated. Many are indifferent. But most want children to be vaccinated and masked. So this is an entirely manufactured crisis. And Chuck Todd, you are not getting it. This isn't a red or blue issue that people can agree on caring about their kids. This isn't a progressive issue that progressives have gone too far. Anytime there's an attack on school boards, especially an electoral attack on school boards, anytime there are these invented crises like CRT that manifest into actual organized efforts to prey on people who feel insecure and turning their, their attention towards something that really doesn't affect their lives or isn't a real thing. That is the right wing doing what they do so well. But it's also a weapon. It's an electoral weapon to make sure that folks, conservative folks, are running for those school board seats, as the Proud Boys have announced but also to attack teachers' unions because teachers' unions are the symbol of unions. They're the largest public sector workers, I'm going to say it again, in this country. And they're the largest donors to the Democratic Party. It's political jiu-jitsu, isn't it? All right, welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Wednesday, February 16th. We have an incredible show today. We're going to be talking about 
with Solidarity Wednesdays, you guys know Solidarity Wednesdays, it's when we have uh, Benjamin Dixon on, our ally. Uh, he is the host of the Benjamin Dixon Morning Show and podcast. Uh, and then later we're going to have the one, the only, Julia Doubleday on to talk a little bit about Ukraine with Napoleon de Legend. Uh, so much news. But first up, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I, I, I admitted, admittedly, I have not finished the book yet because it is that big. It's the size of my head. It's this big. Wait. This, yeah, half of my head. That's how big this book is. Um, but it's super fascinating. I have dug into it. Uh, Libya and global and the global enduring disorder. We have Jason Pack on um, first up where we're going to talk about how Libya, uh, the events in Libya in 2011, opened up a new frame of geopolitical, I'll say theory. He's the expert. He can explain it. Uh, of course, I have done some work in Libya like briefly, so I'm not completely um, ignorant of it. But uh, I'm really excited to, to, to talk with him and learn more. Um, and he can give me some teasers for this book because I am not even halfway through. <laughs> I just got it. Okay, guys? I know you all think that everybody reads these books in advance. I'm giving you a spoiler alert. I've started to, but, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. But I'm excited to finish it. This brief little break with Jason Pack. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Jason Pack is a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute and the founder of Libya Analysis LLC. Uh, his articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Spectator, Financial Times, Foreign Affairs. Uh, in, in This is another one, and I love this as, as a Greek. Uh, in 2008, he won the World Championship of Doubles Backgammon, and he's the author of Libya and the Global Enduring Disorder. Welcome to the show, Jason. Pleasure. And important to point out that I did play a Greek team in the finals of oh. the World Championship of Backgammon. And I was interviewed by Greek Vice News. And it was a very, very funny experience, um, you know, coffee housing and getting into that uh, comedy with these Greeks. That's I will have to go check that out. That's a whole other topic for another time. But I uh, definitely grew up playing backgammon with my grandfather. And Nice. And I like the psych as we get into the incumbent psychology of the power holders that we need to understand. <laughs> I think games like backgammon and poker really can give us an insight into why people don't want to solve collective action problems and get out of the way of their own egos. So you can yeah, jump into it however you want. <laughs> All right. So let's let's just start off with um oh man, there's 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 a lot of misinformation about there about Libya. Um and I specifically use misinformation because anytime I mention Libya on the show, I get lots of weird uh responses from people <laughs> online. Um and I'm not sure how much of it is actually coming from you know, folks who don't have malintentions. And and that, I think, is a reflection of the geopolitical world that we live in today, where, where there are lots of tools being used to um, disrupt democracy, disrupt organizing, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I guess I'll just start off with uh, what happened in Libya, briefly, what happened in Libya uh, in 2011? Of course, this was under Obama, the Obama administration. What happened um, and why, you know, just free flow like wh why was that kind of the marking point sure i don't like to focus just on 2011 but when you said that i libya is the first petri dish of the global enduring disorder i want to make clear for your listeners and watchers i argue that we are no longer in the post cold war world we are in the post post cold war world and this new world doesn't have the certitudes either of the uh bipolar universe of the cold war or the american hegemony of the early post cold war period and it's not that Libya was the key changing moment, the dynamics that unfolded there, but rather the dynamics that we now all are familiar with first began to exhibit themselves 
in the way in which the Libya regime change and NATO uh, no-fly zone, I don't believe it's an intervention, but the no-fly zone unfolded because it was not led by a coherent Western bloc, Mm -hmm. nor was it led by a coherent group of actors on the ground in Libya. Coordination failures meant that a suboptimal outcome came about. And that's really, really different than what happened in Iraq or Afghanistan. I just want to stress that what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan was the wrong decisions being made in the Pentagon and Foggy Bottom and intervened and imposed on, you know, another country and all the blowback that came from that. However, the Libya failure is not that. No decisions that were coherent were made in Whitehall, Foggy Bottom and the Pentagon or at the UN. Rather, you had a new coordination failure between the French pulling in one direction, the Italians in another, Mm -hmm. the Qataris and the Emiratis fighting it out in Libya. And Mm -hmm. then this led to the first Libyan civil war in 2014-15, where the country bifurcates in two, two prime ministers, two governments, and really zero government. Then another civil war in 2019-2020, frequently called the second Libyan civil war or the war for Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And now Again, just as of last week, we're in a situation with two prime ministers again. (laughs) And who is even recognized by the UN is unclear. And this kind of enduring disorder, Nomiki, this is extremely different than what we have seen in the Cold War and post-Cold War periods. I just want to toss it out there that it would have been impossible if Qaddafi died or was overthrown in the 1980s, that in the civil war that would ensue, the French and Italians were on opposite sides. It was not something that we would ever have allowed to happen. So that is an example of how fundamentally different the global enduring disorder is from the previous geopolitical realities that preceded it. So, so going back to 2011, um, you know, it's it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's it's been 12 years now, hard to believe, um, or almost it's 11 years. Um, when the 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 this is obviously the Arab Spring, and Libya was in a little bit of a different situation than Tunisia and Egypt. Can we like, just focus on this for a second so folks can understand what why the conditions were unique? What was happening in Libya? Why did things go in a different direction? And, and of course, uh, can you explain the NATO uh, no-fly zone too, just for folks to understand that? Sure. I mean, roughly put... Um first in Tunisia, then in Egypt, a series of popular uprisings erupted largely over economic conditions and unemployment against neoliberal economic policies in Egypt and Tunisia that had led to certain kinds of unemployment and greater stratification. Mm -hmm. They were successful because the regimes backed down without using the most amount of military force to repress the protesters. In Libya, the uprisings came about for a different reason. They weren't protesting against neoliberal reforms because those had never come to Libya. Rather, they were protesting against the very nature of the Qaddafi regime, whose perestroika and glasnost opened them up to the internet and the wider world, and they saw essentially how cut off they had been. They wished to join the international community. That was was for a couple of years under his his son, right? Uh, His son was in, in charge of, you know, modernizing, opening up. Uh, I, I mean, I would contest that. I think you're referring to Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, yes. but um, uh, no, rather the, the the detente of 2003, 2010 opened Libya up to the West um, in a certain way. But again, let's not get sidetracked. So mm. yes, in 2011, you had a series of multipolar uprisings. Um, you had an uprising of civil society activists. You had an uprising of Islamists. You had a different uprising in Misratha than you had in Benghazi. Um, what happened is that the Qaddafi regime went all in on the old tactics, fire into the crowd and, you know, pull a Hama a la 1982 in Syria. And that doesn't work anymore because with social media, people get aware to what's going on, that even the Arab League for the first time in its history asked for non-Arab powers to intervene with the no-fly zone in an Arab state. And then you had UN resolutions 1970 and 1973, But these were not led in a coherent way. You had the French pulling in one direction, the Mm -hmm. British in another, Sarkozy acting for domestic political reasons, and no American leadership. Because of that lack of American leadership, we just end up with an extremely different situation than in previous 
you know, interventions and no fly zones and things like this. So that the reconstruction phase was botched, not because of too much reconstruction or imposed nation building a la Iraq or Afghanistan, but too little reconstruction, not right. enough coordination and allowing every different tiny power from Qatar to Turkey, to the Emirates, to Russia and Egypt to back different militias and essentially many powers benefiting from using Libya to promote more global disorder, right? And this is again a difference, which is that this desire to promote more global disorder is the key feature of what I consider our new era. And it begins to play out in Libya because migrants through Libya Right. are crucial. Well, let's get to that. Let's, guys, I'm going to break it down. And say, so, so, so back on the ground in Libya, right? In 2011, yeah. um, uh, you know, weapons facilities were, were being targeted. Um, you know, uh, Gaddafi was killed, blah, blah. And then suddenly you have many different factions, tribes, brothers and cousins who have access to weapons and nowhere no organize like nobody was there to to, to organize a military uh, to make sure that this oil rich state could 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 I mean how do they unlike Iraq like you said where there was over investment in that um, why didn't Obama and the U S say well at least what we can do is is go in there and train Libyans at least early on well generals always fight the last war particularly because Obama promised to not do. W. Bush style imposed nation building, he then made the opposite mistake. And he admitted that it was his greatest foreign policy mistake mm. of not leading the allies and really trying what he thought was to have a soft touch. But the Libyans asked for more capacity building assistance and we didn't deliver it. And, and even more importantly than that, we didn't try to set the rules of the game so that right. when the political isolation law happened in April, May, 2013, and that was like debathification or lustration, but in the Libyan context, well, you know, we're like, well, we saw debethification, what played out in Iraq, but, you know, we're not going to, uh, you know, pick a side. The Libyans can just do whatever they want, but they weren't really doing that. They were being pushed by Turkey and Qatar mm -hmm. and certain kinds of uh, Islamists who wanted to purge uh, even technocrats who had any Gaddafi regime connections, right. so much so that the prime minister at the time had to resign because he had been an ambassador to India uh, it made no sense. And we didn't impose any rules of the game. And in fact, I mean, to, to, to make this clear for your audience, I see a direct line between the events in Libya and Syria and mm -hmm. Brexit and Trump. You know, if there's no implosion of the Syrian and Libyan states, it's impossible to imagine a world in which there's Brexit or the election of Trump because it was the migration issue right. in the UK, which really the fears of, of hordes of migrants which allows that kind of neo-populism to culminate in Brexit. And then in America, without the, the death of my very close friend, Ambassador Chris Stevens in Benghazi on September 12, 2012, you can't see the rise of neo-populists on the right because Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney are too polite to use the, the death of an American ambassador to get to chance of lock her up. And it was this desire to, to create more chaos to then benefit from that chaos electorally that unites the Brexiteers and Trump. And this right. new era of global enduring disorder is the rise of this neo-populist phenomenon from you know, Orban all the way through to, to Trump that uh, we can't see on the international stage except for the disorder that Libya, Syria, and, and Ukraine in, inject in the global system. So was, was the Arab Spring um, and really the effects of Libya uh, the beginning of tensions with NATO, within NATO? Well, we've always had a problem with the Turks' role inside NATO, but you're correct in pointing out that the Arab Spring polarized different factions within NATO. But... Why? What was, what, what was the holdup? Well, um, because American leadership was not something that Obama really cared to do. And when he set the red line in Syria, which is a little after the events of, of uh, the Arab Spring in Libya, and then we didn't enforce that red line in 2012, 2013, this led directly to Putin's seizure of Crimea after the Olympics in 2014, and we had no unified NATO response. Mm -hmm. That signaled to other 
medium powers inside NATO. Oh, there isn't going to be a unified NATO response. We can go for our own peculiar interests without coordinating with the other NATO allies. And Mm -hmm. yes, that fissure is something that I blame Obama for. And without it, it couldn't be that the French would go against Western policy and back General Haftar because they have a desire to be the leaders of the Maghreb of North Africa. And and who is General Haftar for folks who aren't familiar? The rogue General Khalifa Haftar had been a CIA asset in the 1980s, but then he, as a megalomaniac, established himself as uh, the nominal coup leader of attempts to overthrow the UN-backed government in Libya and has had multiple coups where he claims to be the leader of Libya. Uh, He obviously isn't the sole leader of Libya. Mm -hmm. That culminated in his attempt to take Tripoli by force from April 4th, 2019 to June 2020. And although the UN recognized government was under attack and all Western countries pretty much were required to defend it, the French sided with Haftar. Covertly, of course. Why? While while the Italians sided with the UN-backed government as their most important Western supporters. So this shows you how much the world has changed, that in a hot civil war, you can have French-trained and Italian-trained troops uh, opposite sides of the same civil war. Um, But why was France doing that? I mean, now you see Macron. Okay, this uh, is easily explainable, Nomiki. People in America forget that they are going through what Florence Gaub calls their George W. Bush moment. They had the Balakan terrorist attack. They had the Charlie Hebdo attack. And both alone, despite being on the left domestically, and now Macron being arguably on the center right, are going through a W. Bush moment. They're projecting power into Mali. They're doing every kind of covert counterterror stuff abroad. And they wish to be the counter-terror player, Mm -hmm. uh, primarily in North Africa, but even in the Middle East. So because of this this Francis W. Bush moment, aha, Haftar can be our vehicle through which to project French power as being a French mini hegemon through a kind of Gaullist foreign policy approach. So they're very happy to thumb thumb their nose at NATO and the EU, just as General de Gaulle tried to thumb his nose at NATO on many Mm -hmm. occasions. So it's for this reason that if they can be leaders, they want to lead on the Libya file. They don't care that they're screwing other NATO allies. And this never could have gotten to this level if we had an appropriate amount of American leadership as existed in the Cold War or post-Cold War periods. And it highlights, as I pointed out, the extent to which we're in the global enduring disorder. Um, I want to rewind just a little bit and and talk about the role of ISIS and uh, and and it's, and this is again an oil rich state. It's it's for folks listening different than Egypt, for instance, or or Tunisia, yes. um, which makes it very geopolitically uh, uh, sexy, I guess <laughs> is, is is a way of saying it. So ISIS. Um, didn't really have an existence. Weren't they, they were pushed out or some extremist forces were pushed out by Gaddafi and then the fall of Gaddafi created an opening, not having a military, for instance, <laughs> created an opening. Well, uh, obviously there was no ISIS during the Gaddafi period, but you could say that in Libya, more traditional or conservative forms of Islam have always predominated, whether it was the Senussi Sufi order in the East or uh, the more traditional Maliki versions of Islam throughout Libya. Um, There's no tradition of anything approaching Salafi, Hanbali, Wahhabi Islam in Libya. It's always been an external force. Um, About 200 or 300 fighters had come back into Libya from Afghanistan and Iraq, and they did make a nucleus of jihadi fighters who participated in the uh, attacks against Gaddafi through the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group or the Muqatila. And yes, there was a base in Derna of these Islamists in 2012-13. But unfortunately, because we didn't have our eyes on the prize, we in the West and in neighboring states kind of radicalized the situation by backing one group against the other in Libya. And then getting very, very short-sighted in attempts to push ISIS out of Mosul and Raqqa. 
Mm -hmm. And looking at what was going on in Libya as, oh, it's just a counter-terror issue if we can just push ISIS out of Sirte, who was first in Derna in 2014-15, and then had its third largest base globally in Sirte in 2015-16. You know, just the short-sightedness of the global enduring disorder is, oh, if we can, you know, push them out of Sirte, we don't need to defeat them as a force. And that's why they were able to uh, take refuge in the southern desert. And, and you are seeing a resurgence of more ISIS attacks recently. There was no coordinated effort to use the fact that 99% of the Libyan people obviously oppose any form of jihadism and 99.9% right. oppose ISIS. Right. So we could have used that as a unifying force to help uh, create Libyan institutions. And um, it's really important to point out that Libya is one of these few places in the U.S. where America is extremely, extremely popular. There were polls in 2012 where Libya topped Canada as having the most favorable impressions of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. So they're always crying out for us to be more involved in helping build the electricity grid, getting, you know, their oil infrastructure up and running, but also working with the various militias to make a national army and do the SSR and DDR that's needed to keep jihadis out. Mm. So um, it, it, for, for those who, who, who see America as this imperialist uh, country that, you know, well, that, that, well, where were those polls coming from? Um, I've been on the ground and I've witnessed it myself and felt it. And I was quite surprised having worked in a lot of places around the world. And Friendlier, what I would assume are friendlier places to the U.S. and seeing um, the gratitude uh, for information for, uh, especially among young people. So why why is that? Why is the U.S. Okay. you know based on these polls more popular? I mean, the history of Libya and the United States is a long and complex one. I'll try to summarize, which is that the British and Americans liberated Libya from the most brutal colonialism of fascist Italy, probably the most brutal colonialism in human history. And then we supported the Senussi monarchy, where the U.S. not only had military bases, but was fundamental in building the Libyan oil infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then we were the ones who were hard on Gaddafi. And many Libyans are really happy that the U.S., Reagan and, and others stood up to Gaddafi and sanctioned him. Mm. So that's an important background. But then in 2011, we didn't do any high handed nation building. And yes, some Libyans are happy that it wasn't kind of imposed capacity building assistance, but many others wanted to have more American led assistance, mm -hmm. or at least setting the rules of the game for what constituted legitimate Libyan authority. And it's important to look at the fact that Libya is a very different kind of state than Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah. Libya is a state that's created by the UN. It's the first state ever created by the UN, and it has a unique relationship to the international community. You could say that Libya's sovereignty is not unconditional the way that other sovereignties are unconditional. It is a sovereignty that emerges from the UN process led by Adrian Van Pelt from 1949 to 1951. So after 2011, Libya again found itself in a situation where its sovereignty is mediated through international institutions. And Libyans would be happier if America was willing to lend an extra hand to make sure that that inherent international sovereignty was exercised reasonably rather than being fought back and forth in a tug of war with Turkey and Qatar on one side mm -hmm. and the Emirates, France and Russia on the other side. The Libyans don't enjoy that they are a petri dish where these new global disordered fights are playing out. So, so now that we um, are in this, this we see it playing out, uh, and I, I can see, you know, based on your your writing, how much changed since then. Um, what is? I know it's not easy to say in five minutes, but what is a, a solution? How, especially given uh, Putin's you know, flexing his muscles and at least uh, in, a, in a symbolic way, partnering with Xi Jinping um, and Bannon building a team of allies from Erdogan to, to Putin to, you know, every single uh, bad actor you can think of. How, how do we get out of this with NATO <laughs> cracking? 
Yeah, I I have to say, uh, I I wouldn't put my money on <laughs> on things getting better before they get a lot worse. Mm. Um, that said, I'm happy to be moving more towards solutions. I've been appointed a senior analyst at the NATO Foundation in Rome, and I'll be having my own podcast working on solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need a new kind of coalition or leadership. There isn't going to be an American hegemony and calling for it makes no sense. There isn't going to be a traditional Western alliance run by NATO, but we can see maybe an alliance um, where people care about things like climate change and tax havens and the increasing inequality of the global system mm -hmm. and wish to see consensus leadership. Hmm. That consensus leadership has not been called for. I, I, I see maybe differently than many listeners to this show. I see identity politics and wokeness as detracting from the real threats that we have. Mm -hmm. And the way to deal with these things is a bottom up mass movement focusing on only the big picture. We can't be fighting small battles for me about, you know, school boards and, and mask mandates or anti vax I don't think people on our show is fighting that at all. I think that they're thinking about unionizing and organizing and and really, uh, you know, playing playing the big picture and fighting the bad guys. I So for, for, yeah. for my analysis we need to have a coalition of the major states and people buying in saying, I care about foreign policy a lot more than domestic policy. Mm -hmm. And I care about the future and the future of my children more than some ideological or emotional issues that have identity resonance for me right now. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to get a lot worse because that's not the way that we're going in our increasingly fractured politics in the U S and UK. And um, if we have these two tribes, be they called remain and leave or Democrat and Republican, um, it se seems difficult to me at this moment to get the kind of bipartisanship, which is needed to stand up to this neo-populist threat, mm -hmm. um, which as you pointed out, is not a solution to anything. In fact, you know, Bannon admits that he is a, great disruptor chaos agent yeah. because putin and g and erdogan and orban offer no alternative order their order is great let's break it so there's more disorder and more migrants and proliferation of arms so that then the world is a scarier place and easier for us to operate in and that is unfortunately where we're at now so we need to be working with our allies and it, it, it pains me to see biden and boris johnson bring the US UK relationship to the lowest point that it has been since World War One. That mm -hmm. is just it's just a tragedy where we're at now. Agreed. Um and I think I think we actually have more that we but I think the progressive movement, the real progressive movement, those who are focused on solidarity and and actions and organizing are very cognizant of this. And you know it, I think there are a lot of folks who are there to disrupt on our side as well. Um, and distract and and bring chaos because you say things that the the, the far right is doing and a lot of these these bad actors um, whether world leaders or Bannon they're never offering solutions. Correct. Um, the same thing is happening with uh, chaos agents who are acting on the left. You know, complaining about uh, American imperialism but never talking about other powers or the the dynamics um, that occur on the ground. Uh, they don't talk about, you know, they complain about mandates and vaccines and being canceled, but they never talk about solutions to a lot of these problems. So um, I really appreciate this. It's, it's, I'm about mm, a third of the way through the book, <laughs> uh, but I, I did just get it, but I'm going on vacation for two weeks. So I'll bring awesome. a lovely copy, this copy with me, and um, maybe we'll have you back soon to talk more about your podcast and solutions. Uh I'd love that. I think your your listeners and, and you would really like what I talk about in chapter five, which is the way in which Fortune 500 companies no longer try to maximize their bottom lines or have the quarterly earnings increased. They've become arch incumbents from Facebook to ExxonMobil to Deutsche Bank. I had thought, you know, they want to do more business in Libya and make more money. Yeah. But no, they don't. They want to stay in power. And that is the tragedy of incumbency right. that we're now seeing play out globally, which is that if you're in this kind of C-suite position, OK, let's just block new entrants. Right. And this is more complicated than a kind of Rachel Maddow blowout view, which is that, well, ExxonMobil, it's corrupt. They bribe officials in Equatorial Guinea to produce more barrels. I don't like that either, but that at least purports a desire to maximize profits. 
That's right. I'm saying they don't have to bribe any officials. They don't do anything illegal. Illegal. They don't even want to necessarily produce more barrels in Libya. They just want to fight change and progress because then it's a world where they're not necessarily in the leading industry or the leading player in that industry. Okay, we can just freeze things as they are because we have the WhatsApp number of the central bank governor and occasionally he pays us. We don't even care that our payments come late. And that experience that I had, I think really resonates with some of the things you talk about in episodes I've listened to, which is that there's so much dysfunction in corporate America. We can't even use the traditional means to describe that dysfunction, which is about, oh, they're trying to maximize profits. No, it's much worse than that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Really fascinating. Check out the book. We'll have a link up there. Uh, Jason Pack, really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm excited to have you back on to discuss more. Yeah, um, it was a real honor and this was really fun. I look forward to next time. Have a great vacation. Thank you so much. I'm not even supposed to say it, but I'm going on vacation, guys. Take care. All right. We'll be, yeah. All right. We will be right back with the one and only Benjamin Dixon. Welcome back. It's Solidarity Wednesdays. You love it. Uh, it's the day where I wake up early. No, I wake up my normal time. I just put makeup on. Uh, and I appear on the Med- Benjamin Dixon Morning Show where we talk about the movement and issues that uh, stand in the way of solidarity, things to look out for, things to fight, uh, and areas where we can be great allies. And I'm always, always happy to have Benjamin Dixon on for our show, same day on Solidarity Wednesdays. And uh, yeah, so Benjamin um, Dixon is the host of the Benjamin Dixon Morning Show. Uh, ben, all right. So I wanted to – we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but mm-hmm. been a lot of conversation, but I think it's a real opportunity to, to delve into um, how we can be smart uh, when looking at these flare-ups. And our previous guest talked about this. You know, there's a lot of distractions out there that get in the way of – get us to fight each other, uh, create chaos, but steer us off course of the the really focused work. And uh, I see this trucking situation. Uh, the, the truckers in Canada, we've covered this before, have been organizing protests to protest the mandates, right? Mm-hmm. What the new civil rights <laughs> crisis for the, the far right, right? Um, and they've taken into the United States and they threatened to go to the Super Bowl and now to the State of the Union. Um, truckers, long haul truckers are listening to a lot of right wing radio. Yep. Yep. That is not deniable. They're on the road an average of 300 days a year, and they're making a little over $40,000 a year. So my obvious reaction was you guys aren't pissed off about the mandates. You're pissed off about the working conditions and someone's channeling that anger into something else and using you as a weapon. Yeah. You know, that's absolutely the case. And it's always great to be with you um, on Solidarity Wednesdays. Um, you know, I love driving. I've driven across the, the East Coast from South Florida to Boston, uh, I don't know, eight different times uh, throughout the South, across I-10 from Jacksonville all the way over to Texas. Uh, but I've been at a lot of these truck stops um, mm-hmm. and I've seen you know, the conditions, because if you go into the truck stops, you see the truckers and, and, and it is a really, it's a difficult life. It is a difficult life that they are literally isolated. And the only companionship they have on these roads, a lot of times are the people they meet at truck stops and talk radio. Uh, And those, those, uh, those things, what are they called? The, uh, 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 the trucker 
communication things where they're talking on uh, the road? Uh, oh yeah. Oh, the CB radio. CB yeah. radio. Yeah. 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 So, so those are the only. And then when you think about um, what you just said, though, like think about how much power that then gives uh, Rush Limbaugh over the last mm. thirty years, uh, up until we no longer had to, had to worry about him. But I digress. You mean they're not sitting on YouTube the whole time? Well, that's 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 ultimately it, though. I mean, that's a great point about Rush Limbaugh because the conservative movement, I know we know it, but I think we really have to spell it out over and over and over again for it to cement in our brains. The conservative movement is looking at every single opportunity and every single platform to pull people and meet them where they are and their frustrations and their anger and mobilize around it or – or potentially, uh, you know, with the left at least, uh, make sure that they're not able to mobilize or vote or making it harder for them to vote or or their spirits are down that they don't want to turn out and vote. But, you know, radio, they've got radio. They've got YouTube. Mm -hmm. They've got cable news. They've got Sinclair Media, local news. That's right. That's right. They have all of it because they have the funding, right? And the reactionary component that um, I think all of us have the ability, every race, every ethnicity, every, we have the capacity to be reactionary. But uh, what you're, one of the things uh, that I agreed with your last guest, I, I think should be applied not only to these corporations who simply want to maintain power, but there are people who are okay with their position and proximity to white supremacy that mm. they don't really care. Mm -hmm. They'll just, just keep it as it is. Even if my life doesn't get better, my privileged position above someone else, um, that's been a, that's been a really difficult thing in terms of building solidarity with working class uh, white people. And, and simultaneously the, the, you know, I started off the show talking about um, schools, which we're going to get to in a second. Uh, and, and, and Chuck Todd, who basically is blaming progressives for the attacks that school boards are are receiving right now because they've gone too woke or too whatever. And I'm like, okay, you can't be that dumb, Chuck Todd. You are basically unwilling, as usual, to call out the real problem here, which is a well-coordinated, well-funded effort right. to take on the most powerful unions and public sector workforce in the country, which is teachers, right? right and right. blaming them for everything. Simultaneously, I look at a story like this, this trucker story, and I'm like, why did we even cover it? It was a few of them at the Capitol, but turned into the biggest story, you know, in the lead up to the Super Bowl. And as a result, it's going to grow. They're going right. to inspire other truckers. Right. Right. And, and I mean, that's because this is this is the game. So Chuck Todd, he would never admit it, but Chuck Todd is himself a beneficiary of white supremacy, white male supremacy, to be quite, you know, to be accurate. He's not um, on the cutting edge of journalism, yet he has his position. Um, and so if you think about it from his default position, the status quo is fine. Right. Mm -hmm. He's OK in this system. And a lot of media outlets, they're, oh, they're they're simply fine. They have enough money to go to whatever brunch they want to go to, to get whatever penthouse that they want. They have what they need. And so now they just need to sustain it, which requires clicks. They cannot sustain their lives now without clicks. And these truckers give them all the clicks that they want because the right wing in this around the world is ready to consume these false narratives of full oppression from white. You know, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Trucking life is oppression, but you're being oppressed because of the capitalism part of it. Right. Yeah, exactly. If 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 the <laughs> there was a great opportunity, maybe maybe that's the alternative. Maybe there are a few truckers out there who want to start unionizing, although it's hard because they're not all in the same place. So that's it's, right. it's actually two different forms. Starbucks was really effective because it was a small community in stores. Um, there were a lot of stores that could spread faster. It was easier to convince, you know, a few. 20 workers in one store than an entire Amazon workforce in which right. they can fire, you know, a third of it or hire in another, you know, 500 to come in to, to disrupt the vote. It's just the opposite with trucking. It's yeah, when would you unionize? You don't always see the same people. Is it at the truck stops? Is it over the, 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 the thing? Radio. The yeah. radio. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a great opportunity. I mean, I don't even know how you would unionize. Well, who are you working for? Are you an independent contractor? Mm. Um, but and, it's well, about the, conditions. Well, if I could, that's exactly that's why. That's exactly why the corporations have moved. See, I, I also grew up in the deep, deep south of Mississippi, and I got a chance as a young child to see the distribution operations of Walmart. Right? They they had no problem showing us all their trucking operations because we were, we were just country bumpkins. But they they you know Amazon got smarter and say, okay, we're not going to be directly responsible for that distribution. We're going to start outsourcing it. And Amazon is just one one example, but it carries out throughout the entire trucking industry. You no longer have uh, these major corporations who are holding that distribution responsibility. They've outsourced it to independent contractors 
for that exact reason, less liability. And obviously it's much more difficult to unionize. And, and there's less regulation. Um, exactly. Shippers are having the same issue. They, you, you, when you're out in the open waters, a lot of these, these, first off the federal laws don't apply. Um, there's international laws, which basically lack any humanitarian uh, aspects, human rights. Um, John Oliver did a really great rundown of how the cruise industry functions. Uh, it's horrifying if you have a chance to go check that out. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Uh, but simultaneously, a lot of the companies that own um, the, the shipping companies are based in countries that have that are almost entirely deregulated. So mm. they can get away with actual murder. They can keep these ships uh, you know, in, in one location on the water for weeks on, on end. And they're using a lot of labor from mm. Bangladesh, from mm. India, in which uh, it, they, they've, they, they've promised jobs um, and it's actually slave labor. The working mm. conditions are abysmal. I mean, this is, I think these stories just, the, in this era, with the, we have a new progressive era. Um, these stories are important because it, yeah. it, it, hum, it, it creates a human um face with the policies that we're fighting and then it also i think i don't know i mean I, i'd love to hear your perspective on this it makes these ridiculous things the republicans are saying seem even more so ridiculous when you see that someone was basically forced into slave labor to make sure that you got your like 35th jean jacket or whatever it is that you're yeah. buying on yeah. amazon that's the thing i i i shudder to think how much of the labor that is being exploited by our truckers is carrying junk yeah. that nobody actually even needs. And how much of this slave labor that still exists to this day is for junk that people really don't need, but because we have been conditioned since birth to be great consumers, we just gotta click and get the next thing. Oh, consumer-based economy. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna end with a story that uh, highlights just this, the strategic aspect of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. Um, this has been a topic of conversation in New York City. And when I ran for public advocate, I remember uh, I was asked a question related to this, and I literally answered based on Diane Ravitz, who's a. Um, but the, 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 I, I talked about education experts. I basically took their language and just answered with the, the official education language. And there was a big debate, and there has been a big debate in New York City in particular, um, over whether or not essentially affirmative action, I'm going to simplify it for folks, mm -hmm. um, should apply to specialized schools. And uh, I am a big believer in affirmative action. I think that um, – you know, they want to take away these tests because they think that um, the Asian community is being discriminated against because they have a higher mm. number of, of you know, attendees. And that's just fundamentally not right. There's a lot of, of research behind this. Well, it turns out in this New York Times piece, uh, they unveiled that there's a conservative movement that is behind a lot of these fights. Yeah. And this is, just to give some people a background here, um, standardized testing that had once been key to admissions was eliminated in a lot of these schools. In Alexandria, uh, Virginia, this is the one they're talking about specifically. Top students were admitted from a cross-section of schools and weight was given to poorer students as well as students uh, learning the English language. Now, uh, those policies are at the center of a federal lawsuit filed by an organization called Coalition for TJ, with the aid of Pacific Legal Foundation, a conservative group that is taking on public high school admissions. Um, they filed similar suits in New York and Montgomery, Montgomery uh, Maryland. You know, and, and essentially this is – we're not talking about private schools. We're talking about right. public schools, specialized schools, right. uh, magnet schools, mm -hmm. uh, arts and science schools. You know, <laughs> they just – is this just about controlling the education system or is is there something else happening here um, that's leading us down a path – of exhaustion over things that we should have settled decades ago. Well, this is, no, I think that's the, the, uh, the perfect question for this exact story, right? Because I, I've actually followed um, this phenomenon for, for some years. This is not the first time that they have tried to pit uh, the Asian American community against uh, other minority communities, particularly as it pertains to acceptance to higher education. First time I've heard it on the, on a high school level, but I get it. Magnet schools are very competitive. Um, I'm sure I beat out of quite a few people to get into my magnet school. Anyway, that's what, that was pointless. The point is this, they don't only want to control education. What they want to do is to use our arguments for civil rights to mm. block civil rights. 
they want to say, if we take affirmative action to correct an imbalance, that correction itself is um, is it a violation of their civil rights, this particular group's civil rights. And so what has happened with these conservative organizations over the last, I mean, I know at least 10 years, they have actively gone and pursue uh, some students who want to file lawsuits, uh, in this case, Asian students who want to file lawsuits in order to get acceptance and um, not your particular story, but the ones I'm rec recalling mm -hmm. back to higher education. They wanted to get acceptance into those schools like Harvard or Yale right. or whatever, uh, and they use a lawsuit process to kind of do it. So this is just them, uh, conservatives, not the Asian American community, but conservatives trying to create that wedge between uh, other minority groups and Asian Americans. And it's interesting. I mean, what, what's the, 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 the higher institutions um, are very concerning, too, because, you know, if you really cared about people getting special treatment at these schools, maybe you should go after the legacy students, which which which, which some universities have said just in the last few months that they are going to no longer accept uh, legacy kids. And that's, of course, kids who get accepted to a school and get a spot. Uh, because one of their family members, immediate family members attended. I lost my spot at a school because of that. I found out yeah. 10 years later that um, the girl wow. who who took my spot at Georgetown, her dad was on the board of Georgetown. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> when I went that's, the, that's the other aspect, right? So while, while I know, uh, Nomiki, you and I both know that wealth is probably one if not the greatest factor, right? We understand that, that, that the this, this system operates with money. Like wealth can get you into places that in, in your scenario, right, where it locks you out, even as, mm -hmm. as, but here we have an entire movement that's dedicated to not only not having the conversation about the disparities that are come right. because of wealth, but they don't even want us to get an inch because of disparities that call, come because of race and other discriminating factors. Right, right. They're totalitarian. Exactly. They are full court press. They will not let any angle go. And that's why they're paying so much detail to this. It's horrifying. And, and they've been working on this piece by piece um, for the better part of 40 years since mm, since they started right. investing right. in school boards. And simultaneously, right. I know this is this is something that I just repeat over and over again, but it should be crystallizing people's brains. They started investing in school boards as the Democratic Party said, see a unions uh, and we're pulling and slowly we're going to start pulling out of local parties. Well, what happens in a vacuum? This kind of thing happens and they can take yeah. over the narrative and invest in every single type of media platform. Yeah. It's horrifying. Um, what can we look forward to, Ben? What are you, uh, what are you doing this week on, on your show? You know what, Nomiki, we're just trying to break the news to the people without breaking them. We're trying to cover the stories with the depth and the substance that they need without snapping on these fools. Cause it's crazy out here. Uh, so, you know, uh, thank you for coming in this morning. I know it, it was early and, uh, oh, I love but it. You, you know, it's the, it's these conversations that I think are going to help us actually build solidarity. Can I ask you, what, what do you, what, what do you do with Dr. Mack? What I, about I don't know what to do with him. He's, no, no, Google. No, what do you do with him? Google, Google. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't want to. I want oh, you to explain. <laughs> oh, do you have yours set up? Do you no. Have, how do I do oh, it? Oh, so Can I do hey it real Google. time? Yeah, the hey Google. Uh, I mean, we just asked Google what happened in Black history, and um, Dr. Mack has created this comprehensive calendar, 366 days of Black history, and every day we get to start our show asking Google what happened today in Black history. That's amazing. So, you could, is this a setting you put into your phone or? No, if you if you have any Google device, like any like Google Nest or any Google Assistant device, you could just ask it, and uh, it's already in there. I love this so much. It's brilliant, really brilliant. So every time I come on the show, I learn something about Black history. It's amazing. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Ben, for joining us today for Solidarity Wednesdays. Always a pleasure. I look forward to the next time. I will see you after my uh, my little vacation. So enjoy. Get some rest. See you Thank when you, you get back. See you soon. Take care. All right, we'll be right back with our incredible panel, Julia Doubleday and Napoleon the Legend.
All right. Welcome back to the Nomi He Show. I have a couple of shout outs to do. Um, as usual, we have great shout outs. Uh, we have some new patrons, Kaylee, or Kalel, excuse me. I need better glasses. K Sissy and Gothic One, thank you so much for joining us. And then we've got some super chats. We've got Big Alame, Big Alameo. You guys always make me give me such difficult names, uh, sends us some very big love. Thank you. And says, things aren't okay, but Nomi and Ben always make me feel better. Thank you so much. And Fern Jen subscribing over at Twitch with Prime, always grateful. Uh, we will follow up with all these shout outs that we miss over the break. I will make sure to give everyone the love when I get back. As you know, I'm going on a little break, but we have lots of exclusive content coming out while I'm gone. Um, and I'm very excited to report back to you. When I do come back, uh, all all about you know what I've what I've done over my little break. Uh, in the meantime, if you aren't already, join us on patreoncom slash show and become a patron. That's how we do this. We may not always get along, but it's really important to support independent media. Um, I know on my part, I really like to support voices that um, are marginalized. A lot of voices that. Uh, you know, are fighting the algorithms. Sometimes I like to hear people who challenge my perspective. I just subscribe to someone who I don't always agree with, but I was like, you know what? This one take that they they had um, really opened my mind up on, on a lot of things. That's how I look at it because that's my way of fighting the algorithm. The algorithm is going to feed you what you want to hear. Uh, I started listening to something about Ukraine yesterday and then halfway through the podcast, I was like, oh my God, this is like insane propaganda from Steve Bannon, literally, I, but it was it was shaped through comedy. I fell for it. I fell for it. So I paused and I, you know, went down my own little rabbit hole and tried to seek things out. So to all of you who do listen to the show and enjoy it, please share it with your friends. That's how we get the word out. And of course, if you've been a patron, um, we are so grateful to you. And if you can't afford um, or aren't able to be a patron for a bit, please email us at the Nomi Key Show at gmail.com and we will work something out. is here. We've got Julia Doubleday uh, on from an undisclosed location that she doesn't normally live in. I don't know if we can say that. Uh, Julia Doubleday is co-host of the committee program. She was the former congressional uh, manager, (laughs) campaign manager (laughs) for Julie Oliver for Congress and uh, worked on Beto for Senate and Bernie 2016, the OG Bernie, the one that I loved the most. (laughs) And then we have Napoleon De Legend, who is a hip hop artist and rapper and producer. Uh, got a great background, French American, in Germany right now, still, right? Still, still, yeah. You know, I got to tell you, I can't. There's so many people who compliment our our show songs. So if you guys don't know already, Napoleon De Legend, this is his work of art. Uh, our our theme song. We got a compliment, I think, earlier today when I was in pre-tape. So I should, like, start writing those down and sending them to you, just like the shout-outs. <laughs> nah, it's cool. It's all love, you know. I, <laughs> I did it inspired by what you do, and that's just a reflection of it. Oh, we feel the same. So, guys, um, I want to touch on the state of the, the movement. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad right-wing stuff that's happening. We've been covering it a lot, a lot of anti-union efforts. Uh, COVID, obviously, has been a big part of the show. But let's not forget about the neoliberals. You can't forget about that. Never, never, never do. About our great allies, right? Okay, so Fox Business, I love is when Fox Business gives us reports on the left. I just love it because, like, they know so much, and, and it's really incredible to hear their advice. So let's play this clip from Fox Business on the future 
of politics. Look at that. In 2022, the torch will be passed whether you like it or not. Ben Dominich wrote that and he joins me now. You're talking about new blood in politics. How about AOC as the new blood for the Democrats? Do you think that'll fly? I absolutely think it will, Stuart, yeah. and thank you for having me on. As always, I am uh, very much of the mindset that we are seeing the end of an era in American politics in a number of different ways. Uh, the passing of the torch at long last away from the, the giant impact that the baby boom had on American politics. We've had three presidents, for instance, and, and uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump, all born in the same year, 1946, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Yeah. But it says something about the degree to which the baby boom really had uh, a world-altering effect in terms of not just their impact in America, but around the world. In, uh, in our politics today, I think you see a real rising generation on both the left and the right uh, that is taking things over. On the, in the Super Bowl the other night, we had a contest between two coaches who were aged 36 and 38, you know, with uh, a situation where, you know, their victory, you know, in the sense of Sean McVay winning with the Los Angeles Rams, you know, set a new trend toward younger coaches taking over teams. You're going to see the same thing happen in American politics in the coming years. And as you said in your monologue, this is going to lead to a push away from the kind of moderates that have been there in the past and more toward the extremes particularly in these safe leftist districts that these uh, squad members are likely to win and even more progressives are likely to win come the fall. Do you have any names in mind for a new generation, new blood in the Republican Party? You know, I think one of the really interesting things uh, on the right in, in, at the current moment is that you have a crop of, of younger senators uh, who I think are going to not just emerge uh, in the coming years as, as new voices to take on uh, a number of different topics. We've already seen that from the likes of Senator Josh Hawley, who's obviously you know one of the younger members of the body. But I also think that what you're going to see is just a swath of new members from across the country who are going to be elected into the House this uh, November, many of whom are going to be kind of unexpected and they're going to mark a shift away from the older way of doing things. You know, there's going to be increased challenge for older members who've been there for a long time against new blood. We've seen this in the past in the Tea Party era, and I think that we're going to see it happen again this time around. What they do to the party and the impact that they have uh, could really adjust the list of priorities that Republicans have, not just in the new Congress, but in 2024. I'm a baby boomer. I think we kind of made a mess of politics, actually. And I'm quite prepared to pass it along to a new generation. Please do. Like All right. <laughs> you see, do a better job. Breaking news. Stuart Varney has been canceled. Um, mm. Baby boomers are canceled, guys, and time exists. <laughs> All right. I, Julia, um, I know this sounds ridiculous, but P okay, so, so, so Ben Dominich is, uh, is, is Meghan McCain's husband. A uh, little, little uh, juicy backstory there. Mm. Um, talking about the leadership, I feel like he's just staging a coup. I feel like he's just like, guys, get out of the way. It's time for me. Um, I mean, I think what he's talking about is broadly correct, like accurate. I don't think it's as much like a passing of a torch as it is like a resting of the torch away from these people because the boomers don't seem, none of the boomers seem willing to give up power. I mean, you have like Feinstein who's, a million and a half years old who I don't says, even think she is a boomer. I think she's whatever the older one. That's true actually. Yeah, <laughs> no, correct. The 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 representation we have is just so disproportionately ancient and like of course that is having an impact on our politics. You know, we're talking about what the climate is going to be like in 50 years and whether it's going to be livable, survivable and all the people that are making these decisions are thinking about their retirement, their stock portfolio. And they know they're going to be dead in 50 years. I mean, they don't have any, you know, dog in the fight of whether the planet is habitable in 50 years because they're not going to be here. And I do think that makes a difference when you're thinking about these things. Well, you know, they want to be on one of their five yachts and they want to really um, – they don't want one of their yachts seized at <clears throat> mansion. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's interesting because I actually haven't heard the Democrats – um saying what he's saying as much i mean i've mentioned in the past that the democrats 
um, one of the advantages that progressives seem to have in the, the sort of war on establishment Democrats is that they don't seem to understand that there is a larger movement happening. They seem to view AOC and Ilhan Omar and Rashida and Ayana, all of these people as these sort of like freak cases that like came out of nowhere and they don't understand why, but like they're just for people and they have their internet, whatever. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi referring to them having a really massive platform and direct engagement with millions of people as internet, whatever, is a really good distillation of like how the democratic establishment are dinosaurs. Like they mm -hmm. don't understand the importance of engaging with the public in a democracy. Like what you're referring to is them having direct contact with millions of voters. Like that's yeah. a dream. That's a dream for a, a candidate, a politician. And you're dismissing that as an internet, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so out of touch. And I think what he's saying, you know, that there is this sort of insurgent progressive left and there will be an, an insurgent, you know, Trump, right. Um, that's been happening for five years. I mean, yeah. if anything, I know I, it's, I, I, it's like, slow on it's slow on the uptake to be you know talking yeah. about it now. Like, yes, this is happening. It's good, I guess, that like people are sort of waking up to that. But it's not like this isn't news. This isn't news. This isn't breaking. Yeah, news. I know. I mean, listen, one of our our talking points in 2016 that was my talking point. I wrote it. I don't know. If no one gave it to me. Um, was the largest this this campaign is is a movement uh, that represents many movements, but it's mostly representing the largest generation in history and the most diverse generation in history. And you can't fight demographics. So, you know, even if you're not pro-Bernie, you have to understand that's the trend. And we're seeing it play out. You're seeing a lot of folks uh, compromise on progressive policies that were not supporting Bernie in 2016, but now support a lot of the things that he pushed for, um, including AOC and the squad and other candidates. Uh, this is happening internationally too, but I, mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, Napoleon, um, this is not, this is obviously a generational issue, but uh, baby boomers are playing the devil's advocate here. This is a time of disruption. This is a time of, of chaos. A lot of it is organized chaos, meaning it's strategized by nefarious forces that really want to break apart democracy. Um, let's give some of the baby boomers benefit of the doubt. And they say, you know, it's better to go with something you know than not know at a time of chaos. People who know know where the light switches are rather than bringing in a whole new breed of politicians who have no experience at all is it, I'm just, just i mean at the same time you, you can't you can't fight time and the, the the thing when i watch this segment i'm trying to wonder like is, is it like a warning is, well how are they framing it exactly it's like okay time passes people get all this some yeah. new blood is inevitably going to come even though you know they don't want to let go but uh, I, I I just don't I I just was trying to understand the angle. Are they saying it's a bad thing or it's a yeah. good thing? Like how could how can yeah. new blood be solely characterized as a bad thing, framed as a bad thing? It's it's it, we want new blood, right? We want new ideas. We want people. We 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 want the old guard to change. But I'm just I'm just trying to understand like the framing. But I guess it's on Fox Business, so they're, they're trying to scare people, saying that you know a whole bunch of like inexperienced people are going to come in or something like that. I, I just I'm just trying to understand where they're trying to go with this. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll get to this the next segment because uh, juxtapose this with AOC's projections about the next ten years. Uh, I think the right wing is trying to bring their Pete Dominich is is a very unique Republican for his age demographic. You know, it's it's rare to find a centrist Democrat who's uh, under the age of forty. It's rare to find mm -hmm. a centrist Republican under the age of forty. Um, Josh right. Hawley, who he referenced, is, you know, Nazi light, whatever you want to call it. And and uh, he's a public figure, so I can say that, so don't sue me. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's it's. I think he's he, they're trying to kind of bring in more of the reasonable business type of Republicans into their fold so that, um, you know, the AOCs don't come in and, and, and the really bad uh, Proud Boy types. Let's play this clip of AOC and her projection uh, for the next 10 years. Ron, your take on an interview well, that uh, Congresswoman Alexander Casio Cortez did with David Remnick of uh, the of the New Yorker. This is a clip where they talk about the the future of our democracy. Here it is. You used a phrase yeah. earlier in the midst of this. If we have a democracy ten years from now, mm -hmm. do you think we won't? 
I think there's a very real risk that we will not. I think what we risk is having a, a, a government that perhaps postures as a democracy and may try to pretend that it is, but isn't. So when she said that, I immediately thought of the Democratic Party. Um, this is not a show where we always shit on Democrats, but one thing I can say for sure is the Democratic Party, the institution of the Democratic Party is really skilled at pretending that they're doing something when they're not actually doing anything and then winning when the other side really overplays their hand. How does that work in geopolitics specifically? Like how, how can that even function when you have so many actors with different goals to, to break apart our democracy internally and externally? Napoleon, you're in Europe. You're, you're watching this all play out right now with Ukraine. Uh, well, I'm curious. Well, um, that's, your question is how does that um, – I, I just didn't understand. Yeah, question. I mean how does that work? Like if you – this game of not really existing, but it's just like a name. It's just like an empty vessel. Uh, we're very well funded, have a strong military. But, you know, the curtain's being pulled back and whether we saw it in the Democratic Party itself or the Biden administration, Democrats are starting to see it with the Biden administration or, frankly, the, the world recognizing that uh, <laughs> that big American empire um, exists. We know that. But but like. Well, I, I, I don't think I don't think I think the answer is that it, it's it, it's just a matter of time. I think it's a ticking time bomb, to be honest with you, because. I, I don't see how they could keep playing this game for an indefinite amount of time where people are actually calling it out. Like if somebody like AOC is actually calling it out, it's that significant. And shows like like us, we, we're talking about it all the time. And like you 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 said rightly, it's, it's happening all over the world. Like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing what's going on in France and a lot of people are feeling powerless in the sense of they don't feel like their votes mean anything. And, you know, that's been going on in America. A lot of people don't don't participate and I could only see it getting worse. So it's um, I mean, it, it, it's not uh, either either they're going to be greedy and keep going like that and think they could play that game forever or they're going to wake up and, and, and do better. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so, Julia, uh, Napoleon says they don't participate. It's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, too. You have voter laws that prevent a lot of folks from from voting easily. Um, because the Democrats are just like, do, 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 all the Republicans, you know, annihilate the country. Um, but simultaneously, people don't feel like the Democratic Party is fighting for them. So why even show up? Because it's not much different than the Republicans. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, you know, what AOC said, you know, was nuanced. She said, it, maybe it will seem like we have a democracy, but it will be democracy in name only. I mean, I think we already have that. Like, I don't think there's any, any analysis that finds that... Um, people the public what the public wants is enacted by the government like we don't have representation what we have is an oligarchy that's been like studied and shown what rich people want is what happens and people mm -hmm. know that um i also think there is a little bit of a false framing as you know republicans want to destroy voting rights and democrats are really really pro-democracy and they want to protect voting rights because the reality is we see it in their primaries they definitely want to protect the voting rights of people in the general because yeah. that helps them. But when it comes to their own primaries, they are very anti-democratic. Right. I mean, they don't want people voting. They don't do a good job of trying to make sure people know about the primaries. Um, the primaries are really the mechanism by which the public can have more control in the party. Uh, we saw with the Iowa caucus, you know, yeah. last year it was a complete clusterfuck. And one of the things like people didn't understand about that clusterfuck was that it was um, it really happened because of those um, concessions that were won at the DNC that, you know, mm -hmm. they were going to release the totals and release the votes and show was us. part of that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And um, <laughs> sorry, and, guys, to be yeah. fair, they did not follow our instructions. Uh, Tom Perez took it to his own liberty to no, interpret no, him how point, he wanted. My, yeah, my point is that. Um, everyone was like, oh, well, Iowa just went wrong this year. That's not what right. happened. What happened was Iowa had to show the math of That's how right. they got their results. And they didn't have the math. The math That's was right. wrong. I mean, the AP refused to call that race. And then you have Mayor Pete on TV 
you know, that night claiming victory when like a third of the votes are counted. Same guys on MSNBC months later talking about how Trump is destroying democracy because he's claiming, you know, a victory when all the votes aren't counted. You did the same fucking thing, bro. Like, that's exactly what you did. And not only are you on TV saying this, nobody's calling you out for it. Like, nobody in the Democratic Party is like, Mayor Pete, do you remember when you declared victory when you hadn't won an election? Um, so this whole posture that Democrats have, that they're like these big defenders of voting rights, um, they're not. I mean, right. they're defenders of their people winning, just like the Republicans. And when it's convenient to help people vote, they help people vote. But when it's convenient to stir people out of the voter rolls, they do that shit too. So like, um, I think it goes back to like the same like overarching feeling that people have that the parties are like broadly similar. You know, when when Trump is president, it's kids in cages, kids in cages, crocodile tears. And when Biden's president, it's don't look over there. You know, yeah. I mean... It's don't Why repeat the CD to, to CDC how many cases are, are of COVID there are, how many people are in the hospital. Like, come on. At least right. he's polite. At least he's polite. At you least know what I mean? At least Trump is disrespectful. Polite. You know, right. this is somebody right. that, that talks nice. Right. <laughs> now we've got a really polite pandemic. It is <laughs> exactly. the exact same situation. Um, Your new podcast's name. Polite, polite pandemic. pandemic. <laughs> it's the exact same situation, but we have the entire news media Um just gifting Biden with all of this coverage about it, it being over, which is totally at odds with yeah. the reality of people yeah, dying and constantly. Of, you know, what, what I think is here, it, it makes a lot of folks upset is this just isn't sticking anymore. You know, even mm -hmm. the largest donors to the Democratic Party who are like the last in line for the institution have said that they're no longer going to donate to the party and to institutions if they don't focus on voting rights, which of course they yeah. didn't do. So this is dismantling very quickly. And it's, you know, as much as, as the right wing has overplayed their hands in, in many cases, AKA, you know, the terrorists storming the, i.e. the terrorists storming the, the Capitol um, and the RNC endorsing it. Re same thing with the Democrats. They are so used to being in power and not being checked or controlling the, you know, the ones shouting on the sidelines that they don't realize that the ones shouting on the sidelines have built a movement going back to our original point about generations. It's mm -hmm. part of it's generational and part of it, is, part of it is just the material conditions where people are rising up. But when like the wealthy class of donors is like, yo, voting rights. I thought we were for that. When did I, huh? Right. <laughs> Get real. All right. I, I want to shift gears because I'm a New Yorker and I, oh, this is just, it's just too juicy. It's too, sometimes we need a little humor. Do you guys remember Anthony Weiner? We all remember Anthony Weiner very well. A little we? too well. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't recall who that is. I don't you know don't remember Anthony Weiner. Thanks for setting it up, Napoleon. You're a good player. Yes, and <laughs> I'm being honest, though. <laughs> I know the name, but I'm like, who's that guy? I don't, I don't know the story behind it. He, he was a I congressman. Or should, he was a Queen's is congressman. A, is this a is this a twist, or should I tell him? Well, we're gonna set, we're gonna show the thing. But he was okay. a Queen's. I'll give you the basics, and then you can you can add the 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 extra the color, the color whatever. <laughs> Guys, I'm so, I've been doing pre tapes nonstop. My brain is not functioning. Um, Anthony Weiner was a congressman. Uh, in Queens. He was known for being one of the most progressive congressmen um, before the squad. He was like buddy-buddy with Jon Stewart, used to go on the Jon Stewart show. They had a little shtick going. I loved seeing him on there. Um, Anthony Weiner was also married to uh, Uma Abedin, who is the right-hand person to Hillary Clinton. Um, Anthony Weiner was running for mayor of New York City in the same election that uh, – that de Blasio was running in. And some things started to twist. He was the front runner. Um, very charming New Yorker kind of attitude. Like, like, you know, in your face, if you knew anything about Mayor Koch, just like would insult you to your – he insulted me to my face. I, I was once in the green room of New York One and uh, going on to talk about Bernie. And he goes, Bernie who? And then I said, Bernie Sanders. He goes, Bernie who? And I'm like, oh, God, shut the F up. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so, Julia, do you want to add the color? To this conversation. This man cannot stop showing his penis to people. He cannot stop. He is unstoppable. So he has been in so <laughs> many different scandals involving showing his penis to people. I like he, laughing too he, took, picked, he, he didn't, we don't know that he had any physical affairs, but he kept taking pictures of his penis, sending it to women. 
And then he had a big comeback where it was like, I'm so sorry that I keep sending pictures of my penis to people. I am back now. I'm running. I think it was actually the, <laughs> the mayor race or the governor race or something. He came back again. It was and the mayor's it, race. You're right. They right. made a documentary. You guys got to watch this documentary. So it's good. Really, <laughs> it's called Wiener, which great. I mean, it's like born, he's literally living out his name. This. Yes. <laughs> It's called Wiener, and the the documentary was supposed to follow like his comeback, and instead, what it follows is how he still can't stop sending pictures of his penis to people. Like literally in the middle of the campaign, another scandal breaks that he was doing it again. So then he has another press conference, and he's like, "I have not sent out any new pictures of my penis since January first, or something." Like there's some <laughs> arbitrary cutoff date where he's like, "I that's when I stopped," and then. <laughs> There's another scandal and more penis pictures come out. Like it, it just like happens like 15 times. And poor, uh, you know, his poor wife is like there kind of with this like painted on smile on her face. Like, yeah, okay. It's going great. Uh, meanwhile, and he had like, a young child. And one of the times he sent a penis, yes. his child was on the bed with him. Yes. Oh, wow. And okay. But it gets worse. And then, um, in the documentary, he's very delusional, which is pretty common to, to candidates, but like all of his consultants kind of start dropping him and they're like, you should drop out. And you see that he has all these yes men around him that are like, no, 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 like you're you're still gonna win. You know, he ends up getting he like 2% of though. the vote or something. So no, but he did, he, yeah, he ended up getting like no votes. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the um, women that he had been sexting with like showed up and, and like surprised him with TMZ, like at his at his like part, not victory party, but loser election loser party, party. <laughs> loser party. Um, and then actually, it got even worse because then he, I'm pretty sure he went to jail because he was doing it with a child. Like he was like He's sending probably. pictures to like a 16 or over Twitter or something. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, and then he went to jail, and then I think his wife finally left him at that point, but she might have gone back again. She Wait, hang on a second. Let's double check. Did he actually go to jail? He was prosecuted. Um, maybe David he went to jail can, for like David, a can year. you work on that real quick? Simultaneously. <laughs> um, I want to add one layer to this, a really big yeah. one, because I, I no one ever talks about this. Mm. The emails. The whole effing oh email my God, scandal yes. okay. started yes. Yes, yes, because yes, yes. of this, because they wanted yes. Yeah, the server no. was taken from Huma's house and and and, and Okay, this is this is actually My hands are flailing very this funny. Is this is very funny. Essentially, like you can Sorry make the probably. argument. No, you this can is make interesting. this is this is like a Kim Peel skit. Go ahead. You can make the argument that Trump won the election yes! because Anthony Weiner would not stop sending his penis to people, exactly. and here's why. Stop. Right when they were investigating Anthony Weiner for more penis crimes, they like <laughs> raided his house and he's married to like this top Hillary Clinton advisor. Literally the closest so person they, to Hillary Clinton. Her yeah, like, body so they person, took her computer as well. And on that computer, they found emails that were supposed to only be, you know, they were on a private server. They were supposed to be on a government server. So this was another email scandal. And this is the one that broke right before the election where James Comey went on That's TV right. and was like, you know, we're, we're investigating this. So a prolific, prolific penis has just, it's just had a huge impact on the fate of our nation. Can I just like add the, the, the moral of the story here? Once again, a man's penis gets in the way of a woman's dreams. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> A few women's okay. dreams. A few women's, yeah. Well, a a, and multiple penises, because Bill Clinton also did. I, I, I would argue that Hillary Clinton, as, as problematic as she was, she carried the legacy of Bill Clinton, not just his sex yes. scandal, but his actual presidency, which she wasn't, you know, she so advocated can, for health. Is this him saying he's learned not to show his penis again? This is <laughs> let's, like let's the 40th this. time he's done this. Let's play this. Oh, wait. Also, I have to add one more thing. How I'm sorry, guys. Times? There's so much here. So Curtis Lua is is the guy with the red cap. He's um, part of this racist group that just patrols around uh, New York for the last 30 years, you know, mm. trying to combat cr crime, a.k.a. people sure. of color. Um, he has had a reoccurring spot on New York One for many years where he just yells at people with another guy named Pearson Barrero, but they're not on anymore together. Um, he also ran for mayor on the Republican line. And fun fact, he uh, was in a relationship. His baby mama is Melinda Katz who ran against um, Tiffany Caban in the Queen's Theory. Oh. I think I've got everything there. Okay. That might yeah. be all of it. All right. Now, 
without further ado, the penis. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. A new show on WABC Radio in New York. They are exploring the left-right divide and major issues afflicting New York City and beyond. One of the co-hosts is former New York Congressman Anthony Weiner. He spent 18 months in confinement for sexting with a 15-year-old girl. He was released in 2019. He says he's ready to answer tough questions about his own life, the challenges facing the country. He's joining now our friend Curtis Slewa with a new show, their co-host, The Left Versus the Right. Uh, Anthony Weiner, thank you for being with us. Curtis Slewa, uh, always good to see you, my friend. I guess the first question that I have is, you pled guilty, Anthony, to sending obscene materials to a young girl, a 15-year-old girl. You went, you pled guilty, you served jail time. Have you changed? Are you a different person? Well, um, I think so. I don't think anyone can go through that kind of experience. And I think this is probably true of people who have been through other types of adversity. I don't think you go through that type of experience and don't emerge changed. Well, wait, that's, wait, um, but Anthony, wait a minute. So that's I obscu- think it's fairly Anthony, obvious. That's an obscure answer. I think so. <laughs> Either you know in your heart if you changed or you know in your heart if you didn't change. Are, do you, can you assure people Wait, pause you're it. going to now try and draw in an audience. Sorry. I just have to pause. I love that Sean Hannity, this is his classic way of attacking people. Like, you know, you're not answering my question, and that's actually not my question. But um, Sean Hannity uh, most recently left his wife of many, many years for another host on Fox and Friends. So, you know, just, just want to add that layer. Continue. And they're going to want to know if you changed or not. Have you changed? They, 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 they can judge for themselves. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. This man is not great at apologizing. I'm not out to persuade you so or Anthony. anyone else that I've changed. I mean, I, I'm doing a radio show and people can call in and ask me questions. We did one this past Saturday where people had an opportunity to call in and where Curtis asked me a bunch of questions and I asked and answered the best I can. But in terms of like, I'm trying to draw someone in. No, I'm not trying to make someone like me or someone be persuaded of any particular outlook on me. We're going to have some conversations about things going on in New York City and other places, and hopefully people will tune into the show, but I'm not terribly interested in trying to make them feel any differently about me. Curtis, I would say between the two of us, we have... Napoleon, do you think... Uh... I'm, embar- I'm embarrassed for him watching that. I'm like, why would he subject himself to that type of, you know, put himself on that platform knowing he's going to probably get questions like that because the clintons uh, banned him from cnn and he can't get on msnbc he's in a you know he he needs to call it quit like public life is not for you my man like you have this compulsion that like his compulsion was stronger than him trying to be mayor of new york that's the hell of a compulsion right there like so he might he might as well call it quits i don't see where he's going with that but is it just me or did Hannity like I'm not trying to fat shame, but did he gain a yeah, lot of he, weight? He he's he's gotten a little uh well, you know, he has a new uh girlfriend. Um he can get comfortable. Surrounds, man. Um yes. this man, Anthony Weiner, I like what a bewildering human being. Like, just what a bewildering human being. Like, why are you on TV? I mean, I, this should That's put the my... nail in the coffin of cancel culture. Because first of all, white man clearly can't be canceled. This clearly. man went Thank to you. jail. Thank you. This man went to jail for sexting with a 15-year-old. And our nation's response is like, let's get this man back on TV to talk about politics. He has good judgment. Like, <laughs> why are we asking him about anything? This is crazy. Why does he have a job? Like, no. He's got bills to pay. Cuckoo. Listen, um, it's cuckoo. You know, he has alimony, I assume. Uh, well, I mean, listen, he could do what other folks do write a book. But the, the, the most mystifying thing about yeah, Anthony Weiner. Yeah, he should Weiner, write a book. I should would write honestly a book. read the book. I mean, a I tell all. I would totally read it <laughs> yeah. from the beginning to the end. Because he also is very snarky. And But this, this the way he answered is just so Anthony Weiner. It, was, it, it actually is similar to my conversation with him in the green room where he was like, Bernie who? Bernie who? Yeah. Bernie who? And then I finally snapped at him and you know what I asked. And I was like, you know, the guy who got 46% of the vote in New York, your home state, where your mother-in-law couldn't seal the deal and we had no operations. Whatever. He, anyways, he's, he's, this is a classic Anthony Weiner. He doesn't care. But what you said about cancel culture, 
the worst form of white male who this is exactly what they do. They rebound and they have that padding and they have absolutely no humility about it. And they partner up with some of the most ridiculous, you know, folks in, 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 in the political space, in media, like to choose to go on Hannity. There are a lot of different shows you could go on. Hannity? He's not. I mean, I, yeah. I, I guess the Republicans feel like, you know, if they want to, um, I think when they choose Democrats to put on the air, they want to choose like people who either can't argue well or are sickos, I guess. <laughs> They're like, they're like, they're like, here's guy, the other side. It's Anthony Weiner. This guy but, has to be delusional to like think he could just, he you know, get on these, uh, these, these type of platforms and and look good or redeem himself. And he doesn't even have anything prepared for these type of questions. Like you could tell he was surprised. So it, it's just for him to already have that backstory that you you guys illustrated, and and to to go through all these sending these pics of whatever, whatever for these years. And then these young girl come back out and get on back on TV and I have nothing to say about it. Like that's crazy right. to me. Like that's the type of guys that, that are in power that, that have held positions of power. That's crazy to me. Or maybe he, he knew very well. I mean, he didn't want to go on Hannity or he knew he had to, to build that side of the audience. And he depends on the money that it's, it's sort of like a rising situation where oh, you know, so the he's, hills promoting, rising. he's promoting the show on there. He's promoting a show with Curtis, the other guy on there, mm -hmm. and Curtis's base is more Hannity. And I don't know, maybe they're working on a MSNBC or not, but he knows very well he's going into enemy territory and he needs to get that audience. So he's just going to give them as little as possible. There's that aspect too. I don't know where they're going for their left audience. Maybe nothing. Maybe he's just doing a full hill rising. You know, you know, you know, you know he's running away from his real destiny, which is to, to promote his OnlyFans page. That that's his trajectory. That's I his agree. redemption. I agree. That's the only thing he should be doing. Only, the Anthony Weiner only. Tell me that's not a Everyone good idea. can get a piece of the penis. Incredible he has idea. Passion. He has Everybody passion goes for home. It. He has happy. the name. He has the he history. Has the name. Like, Built in yeah. audience. I have a question for you. This is a real legal question. If anybody's a scholar in the law, uh, if somebody is underage that goes to an OnlyFans page and sees Anthony Weiner's penis, whether he he didn't seek it out, but he's just, it's right. just there for all to see. I think, I think that's an OnlyFans legal issue, not a not a Wiener legal Got issue. It. Got it. Okay. I think um, this is but great. yeah, that's that's a good idea. <laughs> Prolific penis. <laughs> Congratulations, Anthony Wiener. Maybe we should have him on the show. I bet you he would say yes, guys. <laughs> I think he would be a glutton for punishment. I'd be like, listen, I just want you to talk. I'm not going to ask you any questions. The floor is you yours. Got, you got to watch the documentary because I think like so you good. really hit the nail on the head with the delusion thing. You see like the delusion of how he like stays in the race. Oh my gosh. And we forgot one of the, one of the funniest um, parts of the scandal was that his fake online name, which oh. I think he should use for the OnlyFans, Carlos, Carlos Danger. Danger. <laughs> that was his, that was that was his alter ego, Carlos. <laughs> That's crazy. Danger. And it's so sad because you see his wife, Huma, who's who's very demure. She doesn't, you know, she, completely off opposite personalities. And she's sitting there making fundraising calls for him. And I'm just like, get out. She like, is, get like, out. She, yeah. If you, Hillary is your mentor, do not take her advice in this moment. Get <laughs> out. You but can you know, divorce you him a, and still run for Senate. You, you make a great point, though, with these these men in positions of power, because it's it's kind of like you know, they almost can't lose. Like they really guys can't. getting right they back can't. on TV after all of this. It's just right. like, what does it take? And no wonder they act like the way they act, because they can't do no wrong. I, I see that a lot with with a lot of like certain celebrities and stuff. They do so much things and people still love them. You can't tell them anything bad about the person that they grew up loving or something like that. So it's like kind Kanye? of like the same dynamic. Kanye. Well, you see what I'm saying? And, and, and it's, he, he's uh, he's breaking down. He's melting down right now. That is but, a real thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but there's some people I know we have you can't to wrap, tell them but... nothing. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday about Kanye. I'm like, yo, I, you know, I, I like his music, but his antics outside of music, it's like I could do without. And the person was like, but he's a genius. You know what I mean? And it's just, so what? <laughs> like literally yeah. a woman could dye her hair a different color and they'd be like, oh, she's done. She's, she's right. <laughs> she wrote, she has 16 Pulitzers and an Oscar and an Emmy. Right. I mean, literally Cynthia Nixon, let's just use her as an example. Cynthia Nixon had every award you could possibly get. And Andrew Cuomo... <laughs> was like, she's just an actress. 
<laughs> That's what it is. That's what hey, it Lauren is. Hill talked about it on her first album. If you like, they would tell the labels telling her not to get pregnant or something because it would ruin her trajectory and her career and stuff like that. I mean, it's like what 20, 25 years ago or something like that. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's still going on like that. It's crazy. Breaking news: people age and misogyny continues to exist. On that note, Napoleon the Legend, Julia Doubleday, we love you. We appreciate you. We will see you in a few weeks when I'm back from my um, well-needed vacation. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but, you know, self-isolation, I guess. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining um, the Nomi Key Show. And everybody who's been tuning in, make sure to like and subscribe here on YouTube, on Twitch. Join us there. And, of course, on Tuesdays, join us for TNS Live over at rockfin.com slash Nomi Key. And to all of our podcast listeners, we love you. Please join us on patreon.com slash Nomi Key Show. In the meantime, stay in solidarity.